Just before we get started, I want to say that this video is specifically limited to the period between the beginning of the Spanish War of Secession and the end of the Second World War. It is also restricted to generals who were born in the British Isles. There are some controversial additions here, and it's all just our own opinion. You can have a go at us in the comments if you want. Number 10. Henry Rawlingson, 1st Baron of Rawlingson Rawlingson is a controversial addition to the list for those who know of him. And above all else, the shadow of one battle in particular hangs over his career, and that's the Battle of the Somme. Rawlingson was the general most responsible for planning the Battle of the Somme, and it was his army that bore the brunt of the fighting. Yet, despite the failures of the Somme, Rawlingson was a visionary. It was he who planned and conducted the first night battle by a modern army, and it was Rawlingson who pioneered the idea of combined arms operation. His victory at Amiens, called the Black Day of the German Army by Erich Ludendorff, was the first battle in history where the efforts of infantry were closely supported by mass artillery bombardment, mass cavalry charges, mass armored advance, and aerial support. He showed the future of battlefield tactics, and for that, he makes this list. Number 9. Edmund Allenby, 1st Viscount Allenby Allenby is widely regarded as one of the best commanders of the First World War and is certainly remembered as one of the most successful. He had experienced combat in the Boer War, with his cavalry column having been engaged in constant combat for two years. During that war, he had learned contempt for the established higher commands, and on the Western Front, it was this contempt that saw him replaced by Bing after a feuding with Haig, despite having distinguished himself in combat. He was reassigned to the Middle East, and there he would prove his worth. He quickly gained the respect of the troops of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force by moving his HQ to a position closer to the front, visiting the troops regularly on the front lines, reorganizing the EEF into an effective corps system, and imposing discipline and professionalism on the whole command. He gave financial support to T.E. Lawrence's efforts to unite the Arabs to revolt against the Ottoman Empire. He showed capability in both strategy and tactics. And much like Rawlingson, he became a pioneer of modern war warfare with his victory at Megiddo being considered the precursor to Blitzkrieg. Number 8. Herbert Plumer, 1st Viscount Plumer Plumer looked the part of a typical First World War British general with his receding chin and white moustache, yet he was anything but. Plumer was a man who operated in prudent reality. He did not expect his army to break through the enemy lines and to charge Berlin, nor did he expect his men to be superhuman. In his detailed plans, he planned for only modest goals, keeping in mind the weather and the terrain and the morale of his men. He then trained his men thoroughly for the task that he had set them. Daddy Plumer was arguably the finest commander on the Western Front, and his victory at Messon was one of the most complete in the entire war. Number 7. Douglas Haig, 1st Earl Haig Haig is the most controversial addition to this video. His reputation is a very bad one, as he's characterized as a general who sat hundreds of miles behind the front line and had a willful disregard for the lives of his men. People have described him as the donkey that commanded the lions. This is inescapable, and there is a degree of truth to it. However, Haig did accomplish a few positive things as well. While he was not the most familiar with the modern science of warfare, and he was slow to recognize its use, he did encourage its development and supported subordinates who proved capable of using it. Under Haig, British armies became the most mechanized force in the world. While others relied more heavily on the outdated cavalry, he embraced the tank, enlarged the artillery, and in the final campaign of the war, oversaw the biggest victory ever achieved by Britain in any war in the Hundred Days Offensive. Number 6. Alan Brook, 1st Viscount Alan Brook Alan Brooke was the premier strategist at the Western Allies' disposal in Europe in the Second World War. He had proven himself to be an effective commander of troops when he was commander of the Second Corps of the BEF in the Battle of France, but he would prove his worth far greater as the chief of the Imperial General Staff. In this role, he was responsible for deciding what theatre got what in terms of manpower and logistics, and for choosing the commanders of the various theatres and armies. However, he was sometimes handicapped in this by Winston Churchill's interference. Brooke was well known for opposing Churchill's desires, and Les Churchill had an idea that was grounded in sound military thought. It was Brooke who insisted that the Mediterranean was cleared for Allied shipping before any invasion of continental Europe took place. It was he who demanded that the Italians be knocked out of the war before an invasion of France took place. And finally, it was he who insisted that the northern cross-channel invasion of France received full support and that nothing be transferred to southern France. He was constantly at odds with the American High Command 
Khan, some of whom accused him of lacking aggression, and he clashed with Marshall and Eisenhower over Allied strategy. However, nobody for the Western Allies had more influence in how the war in Europe unfolded than Alan Brooke. With Churchill, he combined to create the most effective higher command of any nation of the war, despite the sometimes flawed judgment and the increasing constraints that it operated under. Number 5. Robert Clive, 1st Baron Clive Clive of India, as is his most famous name, was the man responsible for the conquest of India by the British Empire. Before he arrived, there were localized groups of armed troops defending commercial interests of the European nations, and he received his first taste of warfare in the First Carnatic War. During that war, he was taken ill and had to return to the UK to recuperate. When he returned to India, the balance of power had shifted firmly in France's favor. His first action was to take Arcot, the capital of the Carnatic region, and hold it for 50 days in a siege against the ruler of the region. This was the French sympathetic Chanda Sahib. This made Clive famous and led to the British being able to equalize power between them and the French in the region, an equality that only lasted until Clive's absence when the French retook power. In the Seven Years' War, he returned to India. There, he retook Calcutta after it had fallen to Siraj Udaula. He then marched through the middle of the Nawab's camp to break a siege where the enemy had 40,000 cavalry, 60,000 infantry, and 30 cannons. Meanwhile, Clive had but 540 British infantry, 600 British soldiers, 800 sepoys, 14 field guns, and no cavalry. He then went on to win his decisive and most famous victory at Plassey, which ensured that the British presence in India was unassailable. While undoubtedly a skilled and daring tactician and a competent organizer, perhaps Clive's greatest strength was his mastery of politics. Number 4. William Slim, 1st Viscount Slim Bill Slim has been called the greatest commander of the 20th century. Unlike his high-profile contemporary Montgomery, he was a humble man. He was self-deprecating and candid in talking about the mistakes that he made as well as the lessons he learned. His 14th Army was an amalgamation of British, Australian, New Zealanders, Indian, and African troops, yet he fostered a spirit of unity within them that was unequaled by any other army of the war. He had the oldest equipment of any Allied army and had to handle the most trying and difficult of logistical operations. He was inventing with both tactical and strategic operations while not being reckless, and he held down significant numbers of Japanese troops which otherwise could have been used to oppose American operations in New Guinea, the Philippines, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Nobody in the Second World War achieved more with less than William Slim. Number 3. Bernard Montgomery, 1st Viscount Montgomery Montgomery is another controversial figure of history, with his legacy caught up in nationalistic arguments and his less flamboyant command style overshadowed by the blitzkriegs of the day. Monty was a thorough trainer and planner, a high-class administrator, and a totally professional soldier in general. However, he was a very difficult man to know and work with on a personal level. He always thought he was right, and he rarely compromised, usually having compromise forced upon him. He was, quite simply, a self-obsessed and self-glorifying bully. The balance between Monty's professional virtues and his personal faults was often difficult to maintain, but usually his professional virtues outweighed his personal faults. He was one of the few commanders to come out of the Battle of France with his reputation enhanced. He beat Rommel at Alam al Haifa and El Alamein and never looked back. He only lost one major engagement in the entire war, Market Garden, and played a major role in the successful execution of Overlord and the defeat of the Ardennes Offensive. Number 2. Arthur Wellesley, the first Duke of Wellington The Duke of Wellington was outstanding in everything he did. He never lost a major battle to any opponent. He beat every commander ever sent against him and ruined many of their reputations, and most famously, he defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. His victories at Assaye, Salamanca, and Vitoria are as good as any one during the Napoleonic Wars. His mastery of logistics and forward planning meant that he was never caught out by an enemy and usually picked the field of battle. His insistence on keeping his army from harassing the local population saved him from having to deal with the problem of partisans. His ability to maintain good relations with political elements in the UK as well as in Spain and Portugal ensured that he was never undermined for non-military reasons. His record of success is greater than any other general of his era, except Alexander Suvorov. Number 1. John Churchill, 1st Duke of Marlborough 
The Duke of Marlborough was, by far, the greatest military man of his generation. He was a ruthlessly ambitious man who was prepared to stoop to almost any level in pursuit of wealth and personal glory. He had a grasp of both the immediate and wider strategic details and was a master of maneuver and tactics. He was also a high-class administrator and a master logistician. He spent considerable concern on the welfare of his troops, and when tested on the field of battle, he always prevailed. His great victories at Blenheim, Udena, and Remy were as great as any victory ever won on the European continent and aided a great deal in the increase of Britain's prestige and influence in Europe. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. If you're looking for something else to watch right now, why not check out another video linked to on the screen. And as always, thank you for watching.